Well, a very warm welcome to this week's podcast. If it's your first time joining us, an especially warm welcome to you. We do hope you can find somewhere quiet and somewhere peaceful for the next 20 minutes or so as we delve into the Word of God to find out what the Bible has to say to us in these times. It's the second week of Advent and Christmas is coming at a pace. This year, Christmas seems to have a very different feel to it than what we normally have. But in essence, Christmas hasn't changed. When Jesus is the focus of our Christmas celebrations, he transcends all our circumstances. But we rather tend to make Christmas all about us, about our celebrations, about what we want to do. And yes, for this Christmas, things will be different for us. But let's start off with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, Advent is all about waiting and expecting you to come in the person of your Son. Lord, we couldn't come to you. We couldn't rise up to heaven to greet you because we were helpless to do so. But you, in your grace, decided to come down to visit us, to rescue us from our sins, and to change us into the likeness of your Son. Father, in these restricted times, help us to find the real meaning of Christmas again, of Emmanuel, God with us. May we, who dwell in darkness, again perceive your great light, and from our hearts may we sing glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to all peoples. And when Jesus came, he taught those who would hear how to pray to you. And so together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In recent weeks, we've spent much time in the Gospel of Matthew, looking particularly at what Jesus had to say about his second advent, his second coming, or his second appearing, his coming at the consummation of the ages, something we still look forward to when he will come to judge the quick and the dead and bring the fullness of the kingdom of God in his full glory. But this week, we're going to focus again on the first advent, his first coming, His coming as the servant king, or as the theologian put it, his coming in humiliation. When we're thinking about Christ's coming, we should never forget the purpose for which he came, which the Apostle Paul succinctly puts like this. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus in his own words says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. It's interesting that in God's design, Jesus' very name is linked with his mission. In the Nativity account in Matthew's Gospel, Joseph is told in a dream by an angel that the baby in Mary's womb was to be given the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And the word Jesus, or the name Jesus, if we looked at the Hebrew version of it, is the word Yeshua, or to anglicise it, Joshua. And that literally, in Hebrew, means God saves. Familiar as though we are with the story of Jesus' first advent, we should never forget how much of a miracle it really was that God should come to us in recognition of the fact that we have no power of ourselves to come to him. The significance of the birth of Jesus, of course, all depends upon who this Christ child is. Last week we looked at the opening chapter of John, where John introduces us to Jesus as the divine Logos, who not only was with God, but was God, and that more than that, the entire universe was created through him, and that the miracle of the incarnation is that the infinite God should become finite and took upon our humanity. The creator entered his creation and became a person like you and I, able to suffer, able to be tempted, yet without sin. Well, much like today, in ancient times, no king would go anywhere without sending his entourage or his heralds on before him to prepare the way. And today we're introduced to God's special herald for the coming of Jesus in his ministry, and that is the figure of John the Baptist. Our reading today comes from the first eight verses of Mark's Gospel, and Mike's going to read that for us now. Our Gospel reading is from the Gospel of St Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. 
John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole of Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him, and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Many theologians think that Mark's Gospel was written primarily for a Gentile audience, possibly the church in Rome. It doesn't start, for example, with any Jewish genealogies tracing Jesus' ancestry back to people like King David. Nor does he give us any account of the nativity story either, but starts with Jesus as a grown man on the verge of starting his earthly ministry. Mark, as the shortest of the four Gospels, is usually very concise in what he says. And he starts off with telling us that what he's writing about, of course, is the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The word in the original Greek for gospel is the word evangelion, and I rather like William Tyndale's definition of the word, where he says it's a Greek word, and signifieth good, merry, glad, and joyful tidings, that maketh a man's heart glad, and maketh him sing, dance, and leap for joy. If you remember, William Tyndale was the first person to translate the whole of the Bible into English, starting from the Hebrew and Greek texts something which, in fact, he ended up being executed for by the religious authorities of the day. Mark, in his opening sentence, also reminds us that the good news is a person, not a thing. It's enshrined in the very person and nature of who Jesus was, in him being the Son of God. To fully appreciate the impact of Jesus' coming, one needs to know a little bit about the state of Israel spiritually at the time. They were in the time of the Great Silence, which had lasted for 400 years since the death of the last prophet in the Old Testament, which of course is Malachi. So the New Testament and the Old Testament are separated in terms of hearing from God by a period of 400 years. Those of you who are familiar with your Old Testament will know that the second half of the Old Testament is primarily made up of the writing of the prophets. The word prophet literally means one who speaks for or on behalf of another. So in Old Testament times, God would speak to his people through the prophets who were inspired by the Holy Spirit to do so. And many of them were guided to write down what God had told them so that we have the prophetic books of the Old Testament, such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and so on. God often raised up prophets for the people of Israel at times when things in the kingdom were not right, where they had wandered away from following the one true God with whom they had a covenant relationship. The prophets give Israel an insight into how things are from God's perspective rather than theirs. They're often messages of warning to change, and also they have an element of judgment in them. They warn of the consequences of continuing in injustice towards other people and rebellion to God and his law. However serious the prospects of impending temporal judgment were, most of the prophets finish off with God promising ultimate future restoration of his people. Several of the prophets, such as Isaiah, link with this restoration and ultimate blessing of God's people with the coming of one called the Messiah, the true king who would bring into being the kingdom reign of God. We get the word Messiah from the Hebrew word Mashiach, and it literally means the anointed one. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the word is Christos, and that's where we, of course, get Christ from. So Jesus Christ is Jesus, the one with the anointing from God. The significance of the word anointing relates to the work of God the Holy Spirit. So one who was anointed by God was one on or in whom the Holy Spirit dwelt. In the Old Testament, there were three groups of people who were anointed for their service to God. There were the prophets, there were the priests, and there were the kings. And oil, olive oil, was used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit when they were ordained for their particular ministry. This anointing with oil still forms part of the coronation ceremony of British kings and queens. So the prophets were the means by which God spoke to his people. 
The priests, on the other hand, were the way that the people spoke to God. They interceded on the people's behalf, and the kings exercised God's authority in temporal rulership. The New Testament presents to us Jesus as being the ultimate fulfilment of all these three ministries. Jesus is presented as prophet, priest, and king. In the introduction of John the Baptist in our reading, Mark connects his ministry with the prophets of old. So Mark sees John the Baptist as the final Old Testament prophet, in a sense, linking the old with the new. He certainly has the appearance of a prophet with his rough clothing and his strange diet and ascetic lifestyle. John is the divine herald proclaiming, prepare the way of the Lord. A quote from Isaiah. So the one who is coming is the Lord. Not a Lord, but the Lord. The word for Lord in Greek is Kyrios, and John the Baptist's hearers knew all about Kyrios. They were part of the Roman Empire, which demanded that everybody should proclaim that Caesar was Kyrios, something which the Jews and Christians in their turn would refuse to attest. Lords in our own day have very little ultimate power and authority. But in Jesus' day, your Lord was one who had authority over you, to whom you had to give allegiance, and thus you were duty-bound to obey their commands. To get a fuller sense of who this Lord is who is coming, it's worth going back into the Old Testament to Isaiah chapter 40 to look at the original version. Translating from the Hebrew, verse 3 of Isaiah 40 goes like this. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. If you go to your own copy of the Bible and look at the word Lord in verse 3, you'll see that it's typed there in capital letters. And that signifies that the Hebrew word there for Lord is the word Yahweh, which of course is the name of God himself. And this is emphasised again in the second part where it says, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So Isaiah 40 makes very plain what might be missed in its quotation in Mark 1, that it is God who is coming, not a mere man, not a prophet, but God himself in the person of his Son. The first part of the prophetic quotation in Mark's Gospel here isn't actually from Isaiah at all. The second part is, but the first part isn't. It's from Malachi, and it introduces to us the ministry of John the Baptist, The original quote from Malachi says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Elijah was the most famous of the prophets of the Old Testament. He's the one who challenged the prophets of Baal and destroyed them in the time of wicked King Ahab and his queen, Queen Jezebel. So John the Baptist is portrayed as the Elijah who was to come to prepare the way of the Lord. John the Baptist himself refused the claim of being Elijah But Jesus affirms him as such in Matthew's Gospel, where he says, But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognise him. They did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man is about to suffer at his hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the Baptist. So John's ministry was to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus, to tell people that he was on the way. To understand how the people responded to this news, one has to understand the mind of his Jewish hearers concerning this coming of Messiah. In the New Testament, we're shown that Christ's coming was going to be in two stages. The first stage would be a coming in grace to save his people, and the second coming would be to come and to judge his people and to set up the fullness of his kingdom. In the Old Testament, the impression is given that this is all going to happen at more or less the same time, that Messiah was going to come once and destroy his enemies, cleanse his people, and set up his kingdom. So getting right before Messiah comes was of the greatest importance if they were to escape judgment. And in a sense, of course, it still is. So John's message is one of baptism for repentance and forgiveness. Although baptism is a very common sacrament in the life of the church, in Judaism it's a very rare occurrence and has a different significance. The only form of baptism we find in Judaism is what is called proselytic baptism. It's when somebody who is not a Jew wishes to become a Jew. And the baptism is one of ritual cleansing so that the Gentile may be made clean and enter God's household. In Judaism, people born into a Jewish family were already thought of as being clean because they were part of God's covenant family. 
So John's insistence upon baptism is a radical departure from normal practice. He's saying that from God's perspective, his people are no longer clean and that they need to become richly clean again in order to be acceptable to him. It's also worth noting what this cleansing baptism involved. It involved the processes of both repentance and forgiveness. Repentance on our side, forgiveness on God's side. In the Bible, repentance and forgiveness are inextricably linked. Forgiveness is dependent upon repentance. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness. In the Greek New Testament, the word for repentance is metanoia, and it's a strong word. It's not just vague feelings of being sorry, but it involves a profound change of mind or a change of heart at the very centre of your being, resulting in a changed life. That which elsewhere John calls the fruits of repentance. So to repent is to recognise that you've been going completely the wrong way and that you almost need to, in your life, turn through 180 degrees and stop going your way and start going God's way. It's also worth noting that the people in coming to John for baptism were expressing their repentance through confession of their sins. And a crucial part of repentance is actually owning up to our sins. John, in his first letter, writes the divine promise that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He also warns us by saying, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and that the truth is not in us. It's worth noting that in a lot of Protestant Christian traditions, the concept of confession has been to a degree lost, but there's great power in it. And when it is done sensitively and quietly with somebody we know and trust, then it can have great power in helping us to receive a sense of being forgiven by God. John then elevates Jesus, who is going to come by humbling himself and claiming that he wasn't worthy even to untie the sandals of Jesus, which was the role of the most menial servant in a household. John then starts to give his hearers some understanding of what the Messiah was going to do when he came. He says, I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. And some of the other gospel writers add the word and fire as well. The New Testament tells us that a lot of the rituals of the Old Testament were types. They were symbolic, that they pointed forward to the reality of what God was going to do in person, but that they weren't effectual in themselves. So John's baptism was a ritual. It couldn't of itself really do anything. It was symbolic. They all pointed forward to the reality of what the Messiah was going to do. And the heart of what Jesus was going to do for his people involved the person of the Holy Spirit. If you remember in our introduction, we mentioned the fact that in the Old Testament, it was only very special people whom the Holy Spirit anointed to give them the authority and the power to be prophets, priests or kings. Yet here, John the Baptist is proclaiming that when Messiah comes, he will baptise his people in the Holy Spirit. And the word baptise literally means to fill, to complete overflowing, to immerse in the Holy Spirit, the very life of God. So the ultimate purpose of Christ's coming involved the life of God being placed inside his people. And not just some of them, but all of them. To renew them, to conform them to the image of Christ, to give them eternal life. So not just an external anointing with power for service but an indwelling of God that would change the very heart of their being. The symbol of the Holy Spirit as being fire as well refers to his role in purifying and the removal of the dross of sin from our lives. So the Holy Spirit would come and remove sin from his people, both outward and inward, and their very bodies would become temples of the living God. So the good news of Jesus is not just that he's come to atone for our sins that we might be forgiven, but he's come to transform us by indwelling us by his spirit and making us new creatures. And I pray that we may experience the reality of that in our lives today. And so to our prayers of intercession, which Mike is going to lead us in now. Lord, you come to us in power 
to send us out in your name. Strengthen us to proclaim the good news without fear. May we be able to say, Here is your God, and show forth your glory in our land. We pray for preachers of the word and ministers of the sacraments, for all who lead worship, and for the choirs and organists that we so miss. We pray for our spiritual leaders, for all who seek to witness to your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who influence the minds of your people. We pray for the press and for broadcasters, for those who, through the spoken word or written word, affect the way we live. We pray for teachers and leaders of young people, for those students making their way home this Christmas time, for those facing exams next year, for all who make decisions about our future or set us standards to follow, for all who influence our minds and our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in our homes let us be wise in our use of words, that we may dwell in love and peace with each other, we pray for the gift of good communication. We remember all who've stopped speaking to each other. We pray for areas where words are used to hurt, for homes where there is abuse, for places where there's violence and cruelty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you restore, you forgive, you bring peace. We pray for fractured people, for the broken-hearted and the bruised in spirit. We pray for those guilt-ridden, for the disturbed, and for those who are unable to express what it is they need with others, that they may know your peace and your love. We remember friends and loved ones whom we've lost contact with due to this coronavirus. We've not been able to hug or come close or see each other face to face to travel. And we pray for all of those who are ill at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we wait for your coming in glory, we pray for all of those who have passed into the fullness of your kingdom. We give you thanks for the saints in glory, for our benefactors who've gone before us. We pray for our loved ones departed from us, remembering particularly Barbara. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we offer our prayers to you in the one name, Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. And so to our final prayers. Heavenly Father, we couldn't rise up to come to you. So you, in the person of your Son, have come down to save us. Father, give us a true understanding of what repentance really is that we might understand truly how great your forgiveness is. And Lord Jesus, we would ask you once again to fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might have the very life of God in our hearts. May he energise us, purify us, and make us new creatures full of eternal life. Father, show us anything in our own lives that would hinder his coming, that would make the way of the Lord less than straight. Lord, we recognise that we are not worthy to release even the sandals from your feet, yet you have been gracious enough to pour out your love upon us by giving your life that we might live. And may the blessing brought by the Spirit of God be with you, be in you, and rest upon you bringing you peace and life and joy. Amen. Till next week.